here with Mario Barth, world famous tattoo artist. Jesus. <laughs> we are excited to ask you a few questions. So, we want to know a little bit about your story. So tell us how your story began, Mario. Well, I don't know. I mean, where you want me to start, right? Go all the way back into my childhood, then I have to lay down on the couch and make this really work. And like, maybe that's the reason why. Yeah, I think, so. I think a little bit of the origin story would be cool to okay. understand, because we don't understand who Mario, we understand Mario Barth as a tattoo artist. We see you in the news, we see you in the media. But what we don't know is the, the nitty gritty, the whole, yeah. the story, the backstory, you know, like why you were doing this and how you started doing this. Well, uh, I mean, everybody knows I grew up in Austria, right? Like I'm born uh, um, in a very simple environment, right? Like I was born in 1966, so what Good. most people don't even know anymore. It was only black and white TV in Europe and it was not a lot of stuff going on at that time besides that they were still rebuilding all the the countryside you know from the war from the second world war right like mm -hmm. it was just like 15 years later so it's not like or 10 years later where everything happened so i grew up in very simple uh surroundings you know uh, uh, my parents have little things and and my father was working in a in a coal mine and then my mother tried to be a hairdresser and they had a kid and not much to go by, right? So it's like, and, and we grew up, or I grew up in a um, converted chicken shed, which they made their apartment. And uh, that's it. So we started there and, and very simple, very like outdoors a lot, you know, on a part. And I had so simple beginnings. It was super, super simple stuff. You know? All right, cool. So. As far as that, so that's where it began in Austria. So tattooing, how did tattooing become a part of your life? Like when, what was that first initial thought? I think the real initial thought started really when I became like very active in a motorcycle scene. It's like, uh, um, I got tied into it. I had some experience with tattooing before. It's my father had a tattoo. He had a form tattoo. He got in the military. So I grew up with somebody having a tattoo in the household. Got it. Um, but he also explained to me that he did it with a big pen needles and uh, it swelled up like crazy. And my mother hated it because it was yeah. his ex-girlfriend's name. So oh, no. <laughs> nobody could remove it, right? Yeah. Um, so I grew up with that. And then I tried to do a tattoo on one of my so-called gang friends when I was like around 12, 13. And, okay. Um, it was just like... A simple thing you know but then really the time where i got caught up on it was somewhere around 18 years old and i started to ride motorcycles uh i got connected with the motorcycle scene in my hometown and of course automatically as everybody knows right tattoos and motorcycle go along and that's really where it started going and uh i received my first tattoo it was a half sleeve right away um oh. it was a tattoo which has been done in an apartment like anything else at that time there were no tattoo shops and uh i still have it today and, and i think that's the most influential tattoo which i carry because it was uh, also on the uh, kind of reminded of your roots yeah it was it was the design on my sissy bar from the motorcycle so and I for my first chopper and uh, uh i still have the tattoo today that's cool from the same guy that's really cool how was it tattooing in austria back in the day was it yeah, it was different than today, right? Or, or maybe not much different. We worked in the underground. We worked wherever we could. You know, it was not a legal business. So uh, it was very frowned upon. So we were just like working wherever we could where there were no people around, right? It was a clubhouse, a motorcycle meeting, a cellar, a basement. Things that people don't want to talk about today, right? Because yeah. the most tattoo artists which uh, talk crap about people which start in a basement somewhere, forgot that they started in the basement too. Maybe not in the basement, but they started in their living room, in their kitchen, wherever they were, you know? I mean, this is nothing else as a basement tattoo artist. Exactly. So it was a little bit different in the time. There were no shops. It was very tricky to work with other people because there was an instant fight going on as soon as somebody knew that you were a tattoo artist. So tattoo artists and tattoo artists at that time did not like each other much. Um, they thought very territorial, um, and rightfully so, right? Because every tattoo artist which worked at that time, or the most of them, were very territorial. They were either way with a gang, they were either way with a motorcycle club, mm -hmm. they were some associated with territory. 
and the tattoo artists enforced the territory. So it was a little bit tricky at the time. You know, we couldn't get tattoo machines. Yeah. Um, it was not like today. There was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was no. Mm. So we had to create the, the machines or find out over friends with know somebody to a friend to buy a tattoo machine. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I mean, companies like Spalding and Rogers or or uh, Stanley Maskowitz, right, with his brothers and S and W and and uh, National Tattoo or, or Mickey Sharps, especially from England. Uh, those were really. Ronnie Starr, those were the big heroes, you know, which were manufacturing supplies. Okay. So, going forward, now you're tattooing, it's territorial. When did Color and Ink get involved in Mario Barth? Like, what was, what was the initial thought that made you move forward into being like, I need to mix my own color? I think the biggest influence in that part is, is uh, the Austrian style of tattooing, right? Because when we tattooed, like when I say we, like I talk about Bernie Luther, Klaus Forman, the people like Connie and Graz who tattooed me first. Um, what basically happened at that time, there was not a lot of chances to purchase any pigments. So they were very, very limited. And then there were maybe three, four, five different shades of color, right? It was black, white, yellow, some blue, which turned greenish, black, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, it's like, we had to mix the shades and uh i have a a i'm a trained screen printer and and, and i have a, a a completed degree in printing so where graphic design was, was part of it so i understood color theory and i started mixing the colors because for me five colors were not enough and then of course people had like uh always challenges with like oh you can't do a blue tattoo you only it's gonna turn black it's gonna turn like crap so when i started to work and use white to mix into the blue i started to create all these different shades and that actually started to break the straight concentrated blue pigment and it made it stable because it was just too concentrated yeah and when it started breaking it down with a white color then you get all these gradations. Yeah, these and of course, possibilities, yeah. If you can do it with one color, hey, uh, you know, your brain tells you, let me try this with every other color. Yeah. And then it started to go. So from one blue, from one second to another, now I had 10 different ones. And okay. I, I experienced first with the different shades of blue, and that's really what made me famous in that part, that uh, because nobody thought that you can do it. And at that time, I said, like, okay, let me do the reds, let me do the oranges, let me do the part. And I didn't intermix the colors a lot yet at that time. I was still staying in their individual line of field, right? Like uh -huh. individual oranges, reds, blues, but I didn't intermix it. And then somewhere later on, of course, through the influence of other artists who were watching my work, mm -hmm. and I, I got influenced by them very much. Um, I started intermixing, right? I added yellows to the blues and started to get fertilizers and bit. started experimenting. And at that moment, you know, I started understanding that skin plays a huge factor as well. Yeah, okay. So you've mixed color. You're in your, you're doing this at home. You're mixing color. What was the turning point that you were like, I need to make this a company? That this needs to be, you know, what is that? What was that pivotal Ooh. moment where you're like, you know what, I need to make this real a reality uh yeah as a lot of guys right i came out from a divorce and um i was on the road i was uh, uh, already on the road in america at that time and uh i just lost everything what i got right like so i had to give up my house i have to give up my shop which i worked for in austria which was the first legal tattoo studio in the country um and uh i needed to make a living so a lot of people always ask me that how do I get my colors? So they wanted me to, to give them the colors. I didn't sell them. I had no interest in it because mm -hmm. I was a tattoo artist on the road. So I made this crazy idea. I think it was in Richmond, Virginia, where I just put out a, a book, or a, a notepad, and I wrote down 19 color set by Mario Bart, um, pre-order, and sold in sets only. And I think I made a price on it, $375, still the same price <laughs> 20 years later. Oh, wow. You know, it's like, and I went to the show 
And I think when I was done with the show, it was about 130 or 140 sets sold. Wow. And I didn't know how to freaking do it. It's like So no, the universe told you. Yeah, they just everybody signed up and it's yeah. like, okay, I want one, I want one. I didn't get the money. Yeah. But they were like, I want one, I want one, I want one. So what now happens is it's like though everything looks different if you do this for a hundred plus people. If I do pigments for my for myself, I make one bottle. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a, a five thousand bottles. I yeah. mean this is what it is in yeah. my house now. I have 50 bottles in my exactly. house. I didn't, I, I didn't even know where to get it from. I didn't know where to, where to get the pigment from. Yeah. So I'm like, holy crap, I gotta mix this shit. And then, you know, it takes you a week when you work at home a little bit and you make your set of 10 colors, it takes you a week. Now I got 19 colors and 120 plus or 30 or 50 sets, whatever it came up to. Yeah. And, and you talk about 3,000 bottles of pigment. Out of your house. Out of my house. Yeah. In a blender. Yes. Where you can get like 10 bottles out of each mix. Oh, wow. And each one is the, so I went out, I bought like <laughs> 20 blenders and I put them all over the house. Oh, wow. And uh, of course I put all the powder in and did all this stuff. And I did it in my parents' house at that time because I didn't have a house. So okay. Uh, uh, they were kind enough in the States to give me a place to stay whenever I came back from the road. Okay. Um, and my mother was mixing and my father was helping and then the cats were blue green yellow because the powder is all over the oh house God. and then there's a cat walking by with the blue mohawk, <laughs> blue uh, mohawk. it's crazy it's uh, but that's how it started really you know and and then i did it like uh, uh we closed them off and then i was like somehow people wanted to know what's in it right and yeah. then i started to go and say i just put it on what's in it so people know and, and I've never feared that people are going to go out and try to find the same product because I always thought if you give them a product that they can use straight out mm -hmm. and they like it, why would they try to recreate it? Exactly. It makes no, it makes no sense, right? It's like yeah. if you go and buy a, a Ferrari and you like it, what? You go in your garage and build one? No, exactly. It doesn't work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and that's exactly what I did, actually. Celebrity tattoo artist, Mario Bros. So what was that moment? What? What was the moment in your life you were like, wow, I now have a, I've got a name for myself. Was it the color combined or was it you were an artist first and then color came? Yeah, I'm no artist. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a tattoo artist who knows how to put some ink in some people's skin. You know, it's like <laughs> uh, uh, the main thing is, it's like, I think we have to reconsider how this works, right? Like where we started tattooing in Austria, mm -hmm. it was not like that we were somewhat guided with existing tattoo shops. Let's say the, the tattoo industry in England, right? Or in America, where in the 50s and the 60s, there were tons of tattoo shops which were creating um, a flash tattoo, like American Eagle, USMC, military tattoo. So they had all this flash on the wall. The challenge in Austria was at that time, there were no flash available, so no okay. designs on the wall. So we had to create everything that came in. And I think... It was a burden from the beginning because it was always like, <laughs> crap, you know, I need some flash, I need to draw, I need to yeah. do something. You need like a reference. Image. Somehow, and then you have a customer coming in and you have 10 designs laying there and he says, yeah, but I don't want that. I want a dragon. Yeah. And you're like, shit, I don't have a dragon, you know? So I think we learned or you adopted as a tattoo artist during that time to just do whatever comes through the door. So not like that they were looking out, picking A74. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were just forced to design. Yeah. And I think that was the biggest change was Austrian tattoo artists in general brought to this country. Like just the creativity in, in the fantasy level, really colorful and not the norm what's on the wall. Yeah. So what happens is all the designs, people haven't seen it. They were like, what the hell is this? You know, we were going into books like Frasetta or, or fantasy books or mm -hmm. CD covers and we copied them. There, there was not a standard for tattooing. Exactly. You so you, you, start, you, you created the standard. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was the movement at that time which came out from that area where yeah. there's not a lot of tattoo shops that uh, 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 where that got changed, that, that freedom of doing whatever you want. Right? Yeah. And it was not like because we wanted to do what we want. It was what we had to do. 
Yeah. We have no choice. So, and there's nothing wrong with flash on the wall. I mean, there's some people like J.D. Crow. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't know him anymore. They should do some research, which made people book of money. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. a, a garbage bale full of money because his designs were just incredible for every tattoo shop throughout the world. And they have been done thousands and thousands of times. So I think by sticking out like this, to get quite back to the question, uh, by sticking out like that with that unique style, and especially in my case, the versatility, right? Like, yeah. because I was one of the first artists which are, uh, uh, at the time, National Tattoo Association uh, was the biggest organization in the world, the best organization in the world, and the most desired organization in the world, where you want to go and compete, right? Mm -hmm. uh, competitions lost its stigma today okay. a little bit because there's so many shows today is i think every year there's about 600 shows okay worldwide uh at that time every year there were 10 shows okay so you went there to compete to show your best work and there was only a handful of tattooers it's like 50 60 and they competed against each other with okay. the best work. so the big part what happened by me was like because i was so versatile because i had to listen to my client I was versatile in coming in as a portrait tattoo artist, fantasy tattoo artist, color tattoo artist, uh, um, black and gray tattoo artist, tribal tattoo artist, equally as strong. Yeah. And I think that's what made Solidified. The people started to seek me out. And I think it's still today, 40 years later almost now, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the same. I mean, I'm very versatile in what I do. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a rose, a portrait, a, mm -hmm. uh, a um, color portrait, a 3D rendering. I don't care. You know, I'm yeah. a tattoo artist in blood and uh, I get paid for my services, which is to put a great tattoo on you, uh, but it's your artwork and I'm just a creative work. Exactly. So we are a collector of Mario Barth tattoos. Getting tattoos. Yeah, I think, I think really that a, a, a the, the, the true gift of a tattoo artist is really to read its client's mind, right? Yeah. And that's a true gift. And, and I always say this, and I know it's always getting flack from a lot of people. You know, it's, it's uh, we're craftsmen first, right? Like we need yeah. to learn a craft. The craft is to learn all the trade of tattooing, like how to use the needles, how to use the machines, how to use the tools, how to use the part. And then you need to listen to your client and you are a commissioned artist because the client tells you what to do. Yes. Regardless if you think that you pick everything out, he's still telling you what to do. Exactly. He tells you where to place it. He tells you how, how it should look. It does, so you still work after, under, or, or, or after his guidance. So, and then when you could learn this craft to the fullest, then you can start putting your artistic abilities in it and try to create the best artwork suited for the client. Yeah. And I think, that's where it really starts to separate the boys from the girls. Yeah, yeah I think so. So, the future for Mario Barth, what do you have planned as far as uh, your career, your companies? Is there uh, anything exciting coming up? Yeah, I mean, every day of my life is exciting since I'm tattooing, right? It's, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, there's a couple parts in my life what I have to say, it's, it's, it wasn't always easy, you know, because I had to battle my own industry and I battled the outside. Right. Uh, uh, I believe from day one that education is the key and I will believe it till the end of the day. Um, I believe that it's, it's, we have to bring education to the tattoo artists from the bottom up um, with the colors, bring the best products, bring the best artwork. As a tattoo artist, bring the best what you can every day, yeah. you know, to work, regardless what goes on into your life, you know, and, yeah. and, and for me, it's like I have ne I never been to work, right? So, like I always say this, I, I, I do this 24 hours a day. Yeah. So, I sleep very little and, and, and I'm up 20 hours a day and my life is surrounded by tattooing, is mm -hmm. submerged in tattooing and, and I'm surrounded by tattoo artists and yeah. everything I create is around tattooing. So. I don't know, you know, what's the future? The same as the past, right? Like there we go. Tomorrow, create something new, yeah. make it better, try to teach it to other people, regardless if they start tattooing today or if they're tattooing 50 years already. 
if I have something that I can give up to somebody else, I'm more than happy to do it. I always believed in a very big saying what I have is if somebody decides it's important enough to ask me a question, it has to be important enough for me to answer it. And mm -hmm. I believe by that, you know, I, I, I live every day by that. And it's, it's exciting times. It's, yeah. It's, every day you wake up, there's a better tattoo artist emerging, you know, the yeah. tattoo now six months and they're better than the rest of the world. Oh, man. You know? yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. But the challenge also, what's very interesting to see is that the best artists today, which just emerged six months ago, are already the standard of tomorrow. And okay. that's really interesting for me because it's exciting to see how far it can. So it's just like this wild enigma that just keeps growing and changing yeah, daily. I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's organically morphing, right? This yes. something what tattooing has never seen. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's so exciting, so futuristic. If you look at it, if you look at the work throughout the world, uh, regardless of which continent people are from, mm -hmm. Russia, China, Japan, America, Europe, it's unbelievable. I mean, the work that comes out and the being yeah. each other by the day. So it's not something what's like in our time where it took every 10, 15 years an artist came out where you were really inspired. Yeah. By. Uh, today it's like every week somebody is coming out where you're inspired by, right? You're mm -hmm. like, you look at it, it's like, holy shit. That's you know? really cool. Yeah. Oh, fuck, you guys are good. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and they're doing stuff you haven't seen before. And and whenever people think, oh, this is this is it now, this is it, this is the curve. It's like, eh, you're still on the bottom of that curve. You're still okay. climbing that mountain, you know? Exactly. So I think it's good. So thank you so much, Mario. It's been exciting, informative to get to know you, actually. So um, anything else you want to say to intense people or people in the world? No, I mean... You know, I think there's a lot of people which were very inspirational to me, you know, and, and, and I think it is not really always the top people in the world, right? Like for me, mm -hmm. we're always uh, uh, people were inspirational to me, which um, worked hard on their craft every day or at the artistry or to create something new to bring a lasting change in this industry, mm -hmm. you know, for the better or the worse. Because nobody knows, right? Exactly. Uh, it could be for the worse today. It's maybe for the better in 10 years from now. So um, I believe that all those people which still inspire me when they start working today and they're 17 year olds and they just came out from art school and they throw everything away to be a banker and become a tattoo artist and want to go that route, you know? So yeah. I think it's great. They should keep doing it. And I really appreciate it because it makes my day go by faster and uh, makes me more excited to get up tomorrow. Awesome. The man who never sleeps. <laughs> Sweet, thank you. Okay. <laughs>